Open your Bibles to Psalm 93. Uh, And as you're doing that, uh, would you do me a favor and welcome all of those who are joining us online and our other campuses? Thank you so much for your participation. Thank you for joining us. And I pray the word today comforts you, strengthen you, encourage you. Um, I'm beginning a series today for the next few weeks that I've entitled The Church in Prayer. The Church in Prayer. And my desire is for you as the body of Christ, we as the church in this day and in this age, that we act and speak and work from a position of prayer, not a position of fear or anxiety or power grabs. Not only that, uh, being stuck this summer in quarantine, I spent a lot of time in the Psalms. <laughs> So I'm very filled up with the Psalms. We're going to examine a few Psalms, one Psalm uh, per week. Um, And I want to just show you what the Lord is showing us, revealing to us, saying to us. Because we come into a season where the word for our church is shift, not a small one, but a tectonic shift. That's not exclusive to our church or any one particular campus, we can see it and feel it in our world. Um, You can just see it. And uh, this was something a couple years ago the Lord laid on my heart, or or, or I just started seeing and studying, uh, is how history cycles and the different kinds of cycles that exist, namely major shifts in mindset, worldview, global structures um, in roughly 500-year periods. Um, roughly 500 years, every 500 years dating back three, 4,000 years ago, you see major shifts around the globe uh, about every 500 years. And one of the last major shifts, we would say, would be the Protestant Reformation, which was October, it began October, 30, October 31st, 1517. So 2017 marked the 500-year anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. And again, there's 300-year cycles, 100-year cycles, 50-year cycles, 20-year cycles, and then a little bit shorter from there, but those cycles are a lot smaller. But what's interesting about today not literally today, but, but kind of the time period we're living in, this generation, is all of those cycles are converging. Yes. Where certain things, 500 years in the making, 300 years in the making, 100 years in the making, 50 years in the making, 20 years in the making, are all converging within a 10-year period. And I wanted to be able to see beyond the natural in what we see in news cycles and from political pundits and, uh, you know, news anchors and see beyond that and pay attention to what God is doing. And you're not going to be able to see what God is doing if the majority of your information is being cycled to you through television or news media. You're just not going to have eyes to see. And I want to have eyes to see. Well, the way we nurture those eyes to see is through prayer through prayer and the word, and even better when you can combine those two. What I feel in this moment, in this season, that the church needs to act from a position of faith. Faith that works through love, so I'm not writing off love as if that's not important, Um, but faith because if we are acting just like the world but with a religious veneer, a Jesus veneer, um, we won't be acting in faith, we won't be speaking as the body of Christ, the hands and feet of Jesus, we'll just be a religious version of everybody else, and we will have the same impact and effect as everybody else. 
And even if we are in that, in that mode or in that mindset, we're able to enact change, it won't be eternal change. Change that is affected by eternity and by the spirit. We will be controlled by another spirit. And there are many spirits at work in today's age. And the way we engage by the Holy Spirit is through faith. And we act and speak and work from a position of faith. And just things I've said before but bears repeating, faith is not a manipulation tactic. A manipula- it's neither manipulative nor transactional in the sense of we use faith as like a quid pro quo with God. You do these things, I do these things. It's not a contract that we negotiate with God. Um, Nor is faith transactional, where we just assume God is like Amazon Prime, where we just shop his promises, click the buy now, swipe it on the Jesus blood credit card, and we get the fulfillment in two to five days shipping. And then on top of that, if God doesn't deliver in a timely manner, apparently the pastoral team is God's customer service <laughs> and his PR service as well to try to get you to chill out on God. No, that's not faith. Um, faith is primarily, not exclusively, primarily about covenant relationship and cooperative obedience. And it's those ideas that I want to keep digging in from multiple perspectives biblically as best I can to try to get us to see that this is the church's moment, but not the moment to react, not the moment to act out of fear or anxiety or power grab that our culture is so far from God, we have to try to convince them to come back to God. No, the, well, I'll just get to my sermon. Don't, don't go there, Jacob. So how do, we, how do we nurture that kind of faith? How do we build faith or grow or mature in our faith and covenant relationship and co- cooperative obedience? I believe prayer, prayer and the word are the primary ways we do that. Prayer is, is how we nurture that trust. And if we don't understand what prayer is, we, don't, we won't understand what the power of prayer is. Because prayer is one of the, if not the, most important thing the church can do right now. You say, well, what about action? Well, if you don't act from a relationship with Jesus and in obedience to his word, your action's temporal at best. Wrong-headed and destructive at worst. So we have to nurture that relationship through prayer that we nurture the kind of trust that comes in relationship. You have to trust. Trust is a relational word. It it is the dynamic of a relationship. Trust, the, the strength of the relationship is built on the mutual trust. The lowest level of trust between two people is the level of the relationship. And we have to nurture our trust in God. But you don't nurture trust in God by memorizing more Bible verses. Although I believe in memorizing scripture and it has its purpose. We nurture trust in intimacy with God. If you're going to act and speak and work in a divine way, you have to know God. And so prayer then, I've said this tons of times, I'll repeat it. The primary purpose of prayer is relationship. And it is in that relationship that we are transformed. It's relationship. It's not transaction. It's relationship. Prayer is about relationship. If in my marriage, if my wife and I don't communicate, we are not intimate Our relationship is not being built or nurtured if we're not communicating. And sometimes we we do not relate that to God. We see prayer as an obligation. We see prayer as a transaction. We see prayer very similar 
to our grocery list. We write it out and throw it up to the heavens and hope that God can fulfill the order. But prayer is conversational relationship with God where we serve a God who speaks. And as a child of God, you are able to hear God. You can hear God. And you need to hear him, which means you need to hear his word. And so we need to see prayer primarily about being with God, not asking something from God. Prayer is primarily about being with God, not primarily about asking something from God. It's not that we never make a request of God. It's just that's not what prayer is. If, if the primary mode of communication between my wife and I is me asking something from her, how deep is that relationship? Even if she is an, an incredible servant who kind-heartedly serves all of those requests that I have of her, how would you view that marriage? I might be getting the benefit of it, but we would not call that intimacy or a relationship, right? And sometimes we see God as the divine butler. I can just demand him do what I think he should do. And this is where I believe in praying the word, learning how to pray the word, because there is a divine word spoken to us. His name is Jesus. And Jesus is revealed by the spirit and by the written word. The living word is revealed to us by the written word. And we need to learn not just how to read or memorize scripture, though those are highly beneficial and I'm an advocate for. We need to learn how to actually be with God in scripture. Because Jesus is living. He's not contained to text. But this text points us in the direction of the living word. And when we learn, I got to get, get moving, Jacob, get moving. We gotta, I, I care about these things. <laughs> the Psalms, then, is the prayer book that's in your scripture. The book of Psalms is your prayer book. It was Jesus' prayer book. It was the apostles' prayer book. And that's a statement that I can back up, just don't have time for. Um, and learning to pray the Psalms will have a transformative effect on your character. It'll have a transformative effect on your prayer, but not just in an obligation kind of way, reading through the Psalms. That'll be helpful in the same way you just reading your Bible will be helpful. It's a whole lot better if you actually are getting to know the author of this, the living part of this, which is Jesus. And so praying the Psalms, specifically praying the Psalms in the light of Jesus and the new covenant uh, has a lot of power in your prayer life. It gives you the language for prayer. Um, praying the Psalms, we learn how to pray without pretense. I don't know why faith people think we have to be pretentious with the living God who knows our hearts anyway. <laughs> but learning, learning to pray, learning to pray the Psalms, specifically the few that I will show you in, in depth, um, will actually expand your trust in God, God's sovereign action, and his saving character. Because God is sovereign. Don't know if you know that. So Psalm 93 is what we'll be in today. Five verses. We'll spend the entire time on these five verses. But I want you, if I can get you to see it, you learning how to pray this one psalm will we'll have a powerful effect on your relationship with God, your trust in him, uh, and your endurance in hard times. Next week, I'll talk through how to pray what we're praying here, how to pray that in the midst of trying times, Psalm 46. And then the next week, how what we'll see today that God really is in charge, how that works through Jesus in the most quoted psalm of the New Testament.
I'll let you just wonder what that is. You just got to wait two weeks. Uh, Psalm 93, just some context. Psalm 93 uh, begins a grouping of psalms from Psalm 93 to Psalm 99, a grouping of psalms called enthronement psalms. Enthronement psalms. And one of my little nerding out studies that I'm in the middle of right now, after years of praying the Psalms and learning the Psalms and becoming familiar with the language of Psalms and the flow of Psalms, I'm studying out the flow of the Psalms, how all 150 chapters all fit together and the the sequence or the line or the flow of the whole Psalms and the different subgroupings and how they relate to one another. But that's really boring stuff if I'm just repeating it to you. I'm absorbing it as a pastor, as a teacher, to learn it, to grow in it, so that I can give you the simple version, not the nerdy version, which I'm really nerding out on right now. Um, But this, this section, this grouping of Psalms, Psalm 93 to 99, Enthronement Psalms, is exploring the concept, the truth, that God, in the covenant name Yahweh, Yahweh is king. Yahweh reigns. Yahweh is king. God is ultimately in charge. Let's read all five verses, and then I'll start breaking it down with whatever time we have left, however much that is. Psalm 93, verse 1. The Lord, and and every time you see it in this chapter, the Lord, that's Yahweh. So I'll read it as Yahweh so that you get... This idea of God's name, Yahweh. Yahweh reigns. He is robed in majesty. Yahweh is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Yahweh. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. Mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea, Yahweh on high is mighty. Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Yahweh, forevermore. I studied... Uh, political science and sociology in college. That just shouldn't mean much because, you know what, I don't even know what college was for. (laughs) I got the seal that I finished it, but I did study political science. I had had an interest at the time uh, in political science and sociology. I wanted to understand how people work in society and the role of government and politics in the middle of that. And I uh, learned to disdain it, actually. Uh, I was consumed by it for a few years and then really got burned out on it. But in studying governments, natural government, um, what the American experiment has uh, explored, experimented with, and tested out is what we believe to be the highest form of human government, which is self-government. Um, personal responsibility Uh, recognizing that the individual has a measure of sovereignty over their actions and lives and a responsibility to be civil and make wise decisions while in society because when, when humans are together, there has to be a system of some kind of governance. It's the way humans work. Humans were made for authority. Um, we have authority. And so in, in, a, in a society, the highest form of government is self-government, understanding the sovereignty of an individual and our capacity to make decisions and the obligation to make those wise decisions and to teach uh, posterity or our children, teach them those concepts, teach them that responsibility. And when, when a society does that well, we experience freedom and freedom with limited governmental intrusion. And that makes for a healthy human society. And as much as I believe that in a natural human society form and governments in this way, in this society, we have to understand that our primary citizenship is not a natural nation. 
you are a citizen of a nation, and for most of us, with the exception of people joining us online around the world, you are an American citizen. You're a part of an American society, uh, and we have a form of government that I am a very big advocate for, self-government, um, and limited government intrusion, and freedom, and responsibility. But what we must understand is that is not our primary citizenship. As the people of God, this is, this is a word that, that comes with a danger, first to be misunderstood, and for those who aren't certain or don't agree, to, to listen long enough to understand where we're coming from. Um, Philippians chapter 3 verse 20 says that our citizenship is in heaven. Our primary citizenship is in the kingdom of God. And in that kingdom, there is one who is in charge, and it is not you. It is not me. That God is in charge. God reigns. God is sovereign. He did that without election, without public approval. He did it because he is the creator God and is sovereign, and our primary citizenship is in that kingdom. And the sub subversive nature of the kingdom is that it can and should and will flourish in a free society because it is people who understand that we are not ultimately sovereign and not ultimately governed by self, that we actually can live in a free society as self-governed people and self-governed communities, and the kingdom of God can flourish with limited government intrusion. But make no mistake, no matter what political system you exist in, no matter what the state of current events or current affairs are, no matter what condition the politics are, the kingdom of God can and will flourish. And you are not in charge. And every ruler, every president, Every prime minister, every king, every queen, every tyrant will have to give an account to the one who is in charge. And if you read the enthronement psalms, you'll get more of that, but we're not talking about political theory here. <laughs> we have to see what it means for God to actually be in charge, not just us to theologically believe he's in charge, but to actually live like that's true, because it is. There are many different kinds of atheists in the world. There is the angry atheist, which almost exclusively, I have found very rare exceptions. Angry atheists are people who came from, from religious fundamentalism of some kind, not necessarily Christian fundamentalism, religious fundamentalism of some kind and got beat and battered intellectually and theologically over the proverbial head and now are angry about it and want to prove them wrong. Then there's a group of people who I would call honest atheists. And these are people who probably are somewhere between agnostic, deist, atheist. They, they, they just are unsure. Um hard to reconcile philosophical paradoxes like, if God is good, why is there suffering in the world? And that's an honest question. And that group of people of honest atheists have not found a satisfactory answer to that yet. And I can be in relationship with either of those kinds of atheists. I have friends and relationships that, people who are outright angry at me for what I believe. And I don't care, because I can out-love them. I don't know if I can out-argue them, but I can out-love them. Amen. Honest atheists are on a journey, and I'm on the journey too, so I'm just saying, hey, come along. As long as you'll come with me, I'll keep giving you what I have. I don't have everything. I don't have answers to everything, but, but I, I'll give you what I have. It's the pragmatic atheists that are the trouble. People who espouse doctrine of God espouse belief in God, but live as if he doesn't rule. I like him to stay comfortable in the savior and comforter category, but the king category, I would prefer to rule myself. 
That's the people I, I, don't, I don't do well with. Without casting any more insults. I don't. <laughs> Learning to pray, specifically the enthronement psalms, puts us in a collision. This is why the church has to be in prayer. Because we are at a collision, culturally and in society, between a God who is in charge and invites us into humble submission and a culture who demands a voice and a vote on everything and revolts when their way isn't followed. And in that kind of collision, if the church is not a church of prayer, we're going to do something or say something really stupid. And we have. And that's when I go, oh, man, don't listen to them. (laughs) We are confronted with the reality that our little kingdom and our little sovereignty is a big fat mess when put up against God's sovereignty, that he really is in charge. So let me break this down as quick as I can, but as meaningful as I can so that you learn how praying something this simple, what's just underneath the surface. If you can see what's just underneath the surface, I think you'll learn not just how to pray, but act, speak from a place of prayer, from a place of understanding our covenantal relationship with God and how we can live in cooperative obedience to him. In the first two verses, just real quickly, you can see kind of a a four-pillar structure. The Lord reigns. He's robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He is put on strength as his belt. This is verse one. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. These are mirroring one another. And that are, they're pillars built to establish God's sovereignty. And so what we can see here in our prayer and in our worship, shaped by psalms like these, we strengthen our conviction that God's rule is being exercised in the world of community and politics, not just in the world of theology and the spirit. Um, For Israel, praying this, where this psalm came from, um, as Israel prayed this, they were kept from the assumption that having a ruler or a human king supersedes having God as king, that just because we have a human king, and in Israel's case, a divinely appointed human king, does not supersede that God actually is king. God's rule and his reign is established for all time and for all people. And a statement I have here to kind of see what's happening in this poetry. Human kings dress themselves in ornamental clothing. God is dressed in robes of majesty. Where human kings use and wield a scepter in court or a sword in battle, God's weapon is his very strength. And just as the world is established... So his throne is established. Do you see those, that mirrored coupling? Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established. That just as solid as the earth beneath us, so as solid is God's throne. And it is because of his rule that is not in question every election cycle. His rule is not in question or compromised in any way in political unrest or any rising tyrant around the world. His rule is established. He is sovereign. We serve the one who is ultimately sovereign and his strength is unmatched. As a result of his stable rule and reign, the world is stable. Only in our submission to his established and stable throne do we experience establishment in our lives, stability in our lives. But then if you look out in the world, what do you see? Chaos, darkness, destruction. 
And so we kind of get this idea, well, it's nice to believe God's in charge, but the world apparently has not got the memo because it's a big mess. It's chaos. And then you experience challenges and trials and sufferings in your life, and you think, hang on, if God's in charge, why is this happening? Right? What the church has to learn is that these times have to be prayed through. That if you don't learn how to pray through these times, you won't be able to get a theology or a philosophy that is strong enough to make you stable in these times. This is verse three. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. The earth may be solid and unmoving, but the floods of unruliness easily sweep us off our feet. They batter us against the rocks and underneath the waves, right? I mean, floods, just if you think of what a flood is, it's, it's, it, it is a metaphor of anarchy and chaos. There's no controlling it. As much as we can try to control water and reservoirs and dams and all that kind of stuff, ultimately something breaks, something happens, some storm, some unpredictable weather seems more sovereign than us. And it just brings chaos in our lives. There are things in our lives that just sweep us off our feet. They come unexpected, and they are full of chaos and anarchy. I mean, just our personal example is my wife and I go to the hospital to have our fifth child. We have done this four times before. We, we know what we're doing. <laughs> I say we. And for the most part, those other four went pretty smoothly. I'm not going to say easy. That was easy for me. <laughs> but I mean, we weren't, we weren't new to these scenes. And then, boom, get her in the emergency room right now. A flood sweeps us off our feet. I spend nearly 20 minutes watching them try to resuscitate my dead child. A flood comes and sweeps you off your feet. And you, you start to wonder, hang on, if God's in charge, why is there floods? See, from the very first page, from the very second sentence of your scriptures, God is communicated to us as the one who tames the chaotic waters. He is not... He is not taken back by weather, by chaotic waters that are formless and void, chaos. And I know that your personal experience, if that's what's coming to light in this moment, you, you know, you feel it. But as I said over a year ago, the unexpected does not mean we have to be unprepared. And apparently, within God's sovereignty, there are floods in this world. And there are theological answers for, for how, why that is. But when you are in the middle of a storm, a theological answer doesn't help. It might help when it's all said and done, when you're mad, or when you're hurt or broken, but in the middle of it, that's not what, that's not what helps. Um, which is why I believe the church is to be the lifeboats and the first responders in the floods of life. It's why we believe in community and small groups as you being in relationships so that when a flood hits in your life, you have people who can help your feet get back on the ground. So what is God's response to the violence of floodwaters? Verse four, mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea, Yahweh on high is mighty. 
the floodwaters of chaos and anarchy are matched by the sovereign Lord. Three times the flood lifts up its voice. Three times God's sovereignty and might is established. You see the symmetry here? What we see in scripture and what so many of us can testify in personal experience is that his sovereignty is not just something that is in philosophy or theology, but in actual experience and in history. I don't think I'll end here, but I can just say it at this juncture. God's sovereignty is larger and exists in a larger amount of time than our lifetimes. Our perspective is very limited by our experience of of time. And when we experience something in a moment that seems have swept us off our feet, we need a divine perspective that sees how all of this fits within God's huge sweep of sovereignty over across all time and all of history, which is why we engage in scriptures because scripture gives us the story of salvation. Not just the moment of salvation in Jesus, but God's long story over thousands of years and how he actually does work all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Three times the flood lifts up its voice. Three times God's sovereignty matches the chaos. And then three times on how God works his rule into effect. The the chaotic floods, God's matched of sovereignty. Well, how does his rule get put into effect? How does his rulership actually work out in our lives? Because if God is in charge, doesn't that mean I get to do nothing? (laughs) That was a really good response. (laughs) Good, because that's many people's habit. Well, if God's in charge, he'll do it. Well, yes, he will. But through people, it's, it's how, it, okay. Our faith that God is sovereign and actively ruling through the midst of history will move us into appropriate action. Appropriate action. Not an anxious action. Not afraid action but appropriate action. Verse five. So simple, so elegant, so subtle. Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Your decrees are very, your translation may say sure, sure, established. The waves are subdued by the word. How is God's sovereignty put into effect in the midst of the flood? The word. The word. The violence of the waters is not countered by violence from God. Eugene Peterson says this, the means by which God puts his rule into effect is word, not muscle, Decrees, not armies. Creative speech, not coercive act. How is God's sovereignty put into effect in space and time? Cooperative obedience from people who believe his word. Who believe his word and obey his word. And it's not forced on anyone but everyone is invited and entreated. And so we wonder, why is God not so sovereign that he acts in a sweeping way? Well, here's the deal. Let's just take the idea of judgment. Oh, I think I might be stepping in something that I'll, I'll say it, and we'll just see if I get responses. The idea of God's judgment. We want God to judge. There's wrong in the world. There's evil in the world. Why doesn't God do something, right? Right? Have you ever had those thoughts? Be honest. Come on. You're in church. Don't lie. (laughs) Of course you've thought that. We all think that. Well, here's the deal. God's judgment is so pure, 
so perfect, it shows no favoritism. It shows no partiality, which means if he judges the world, he has to judge his people. So we want God to judge the world. Well, even Peter, New Testament, grace, says judgment begins at the house of God. So what does that mean? That means what Peter also said, don't count God's patience as laziness. So what, are, what do we do? I need God to act. I obey his word. Well, that's not very effective. You're not doing it long enough. <laughs> Hebrews 11, the whole chapter of faith, in towards the conclusion, it says, and these all died in faith. How would you like that? <laughs> they died in faith not having received the promises. We're complaining if we don't receive the promises in like a week. They went a whole lifetime and yet believed. Your decrees are very trustworthy. They are sure. They are definite. They are established. And so what do I do? I hear his word and I obey it. We hear the word of the world and we get anxious about it. But we need to hear the word of the Lord. We need to read the word of the Lord. We need to know the word, the living word. Jesus. They are sure. They are trustworthy. They're not a plug and play, a copy and paste in your life. But they are trustworthy. Your word is not a formula, like a magic incantation. If you just say it right, it has the power. No, the power doesn't come from the text. The power comes from the living word, which is in you. It is steadfast. And this is why, this is why you, can, you can be in relationship with an honest atheist. You can just keep obeying. And eventually, the word made flesh in you is trustworthy and can be trustworthy, trusted. And that will be a witness to people. The second line, holiness befits your house. That word befit, other translations use the word adorn. Befits adorn, it, uh, it's, it, it's a word that means to make beautiful. Like, uh, like, um, like someone who decorates a house, they adorn the house. They make it beautiful, they make it look good, you know? That, that's, I, I'm not that, so I, I'm maybe speaking out of turn. <laughs> <laughs> that word is also used in the Old Testament book, Song of Songs also called Song of Solomon, which is not an accurate title for that book. It's Song of Songs. Like Holy of Holies, Lord of Lords. It's the best of all the others. Song of Songs. It's the best of all songs. And it's about, uh, it's a love song of two lovers, two sovereign wills, two individuals colliding in love without force, or without acquiescence. Force, force love is rape. But if one just acquiesces to the other, then force is then used and one is lost. But where the love song of two becoming one is two sovereign wills in loving, patient, cooperative, compassionate, and passionate love for one another. And it's the same word used for that idea. Holiness befits your house. Well, who's the house of God? We are. What makes beautiful the house of God? His holiness. Not our holiness that we try to live up to. It's never going to happen. But his holiness... In, 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 a, in a covenantal relationship where two become one, not by force, but not by acquiescence either, where we in covenant relationship with God, he patiently works his holiness into our lives. He adorns his people 
with the beauty of his holiness that shines into our world. How does God's rule get put into effect? His people in passionate relationship with him. Covenantal relationship where slowly, patiently, gradually, his holiness overtakes our lives and makes our life beautiful. And then the third thing, forevermore, that, that word uh, isn't just something about the future. It's, it's like an idea as, as the days stretch out into history. So like each day contributing to history. His rule comes into effect every single day, pieced together throughout history. God is more patient than you and I. This idea of the days stretching into history, it keeps us from assuming that I am to patiently wait for his rule to come into effect sometime in the future. As if it's not currently enacted and it will one day be enacted. What that, what us learning to pray this, it means that we are patiently participating in a daily way in his rule, in the present. We just don't have the patience. We want God to work on our timelines. We want him to do what we think he should do, as if we are the smart ones in this relationship. And yet God in his patience works his holiness into his people, his word that is his power, into effect in his people, and he does it in subtle ways that aren't always obvious. Because again, if God does one big sweeping action, uh, his people might not appreciate that very much. It might not turn out like you think it should turn out. And so what does he do? He works in his people with subtlety, with patience, with entreaty. He's entreating us. Come away with me. Come away for a while and rest, as Jesus says. So three lines of chaotic waters, three lines of God's sovereign rule, three lines of how his rule is put into effect. Now, what does all this have to do with Jesus? Many many signs and and signposts in scripture that would take too long to show you. But even in Jesus' baptism is a way of Jesus going into the waters and coming up with the divine word, this is my beloved son. That's a quote from Psalm 2, which is not just exclusive to a familial relationship. It is a designation of authority. The Psalm 2 Messiah, Jesus becomes that Messiah. Then, you know, Matthew 8, Matthew 14, Jesus walking on the water, Jesus taming the storms are all pictures of Jesus taming the chaos. But after his death, going into the ultimate floodwater of death, and on the other side to, of defeating death in his resurrection, Jesus says this, Matthew 28, verse 18, all authority. Not spiritual authority, not authority over off into the distant heavens, not authority in the future. All authority has been given to me. Now, go. Because authority has been given to Jesus, and you and I are in Jesus. Go. Go make disciples. Go make disciples of all nations, not just all individuals. People groups, nations are to be discipled baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. His decrees are very trustworthy. And hey, I'm with you. You're not alone. You don't have to do this alone. I am with you even to the end of the age. I'm with you for all time. 
I'll be with you through the whole process, through the floodwaters, through the chaos, through the violence, through the uncertainty. I'm with you. His decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness adorns his people, and it happens day after day after day after day for all time. And so because we serve Jesus and we obey him above all authority, we then live out his authority as disciples. And learning to pray psalms like these five verses, that it's subtle, it's not obvious, but it is there, is teaching us how to live in covenant relationship with the living God who reigns above all, and to live in cooperative obedience to his word, to his character, to trust him in the midst of trying times. And a church that learns how to do that is a church that will be affected. I am concerned for the effectiveness of the church. Not necessarily our church, but the church. That we too easily get taken up in a political spirit and not the Holy Spirit. And we try to enact change. We try to stand up for what's right. But we do it from a posture of anxiety. We do it from a posture of fear. Or we do it from a posture of, of wanting more power. And we have to learn how to live in patient, cooperative obedience so that when we speak, because we are to speak, you do speak, your words are the word. The word that is very trustworthy. That when you act, it's acting out and from holiness, not from pressure. And you can do it consistently on a daily basis. We can trust that the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Yes, and so be it. Even if it's not happening when you think it should happen. And I think that this is a time for the church to be beautiful, not just a religious version of the world. And that's why I care so deeply about teaching us as the church how to pray. It's because only when we act and speak from that posture of prayer, that relationship with God, that cooperative obedience, is our words and actions effective for all eternity, not just for temporal change. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let me pray for us. Father, we love you. We trust that you are in charge. You reign. You reign above all. You reign in the midst of trying times. You reign in the midst of our personal challenges. May we not be so caught up in what we see or feel in our nat what we see in our natural eyes or feel in our, our personal lives, but may we see you, may we see what you're doing, how you're working, your sovereign action is working in the day today. May we be participants in that action. May we join in the action from a place of prayer, knowing the trustworthiness of your character and your word and living in cooperative obedience, working out the beauty of your holiness day after day. I thank you for this time as the church and that we redeem this time, that we be present to this time as your vessels to see your kingdom come your rule put into effect here on earth as it is in heaven. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.